Hello. There are few things more stimulating than shooting grouse. The grouse, that most quick-witted and unpredictable of all the game birds, pitted in an exciting battle of wills against that most intelligent of mammals, humans, alone on a hillside in a rural fight to the death. <laughs> My name is John Humphreys. I first fell in love with the grouse and the wild places 25 years ago. It's a love affair which has continued ever since and will continue to do so until hopefully the day I die. My name is Parker Gentry. As an American, I've never found a more exciting form of shooting than driven grouse. I love the traditional English way of shooting. My name is Anthony Dolbank. I was born and bred into a family involved with grouse shooting since the early 1800s and it's very much part of my life. My name is Lindsay Waddle. My love of Heather Moorlands, grouse and grouse shooting began when as a young boy, I grew up in the Glens of Angus in Scotland. I'm Barbara Hawkins and I live in Yorkshire in order to be near the best grouse shooting in England. I often think that I have more grouse shooting than I really deserve. My name is James Bowditch. It took me three years to shoot my first grouse, but from that moment it's been my absolute passion. And would you all agree that, that grouse are differentiated from other game birds because of their quick-wittedness and intelligence and unpredictability? It's a question of being quick-witted. It's a question of how quickly they fly. This is one of the great attractions. They're not particularly, no, nothing's, it's rather anthropomorphic perhaps to say quick-witted. They are creatures of instinct like all wild animals and birds, and they live in a very hostile and wild as well as beautiful place and they fly very very fast so they've got this two-edged sword not only are they very hard to hit therefore a sporting challenge but they live in a place which is very attractive to go to and they have so many qualities that make them unique are they are they harder to hit than other birds uh, much harder and is that why you've all chosen grass <coughs> in particular and, and those who um who concentrate on shooting other game birds, do you think that they're indulging in a, a lesser sport? I always equate um, shooting grouse to powder skiing, because I think it's a completely different sport than skiing on piste, where shooting grouse is completely different than other birds. You learn a traditional method of shooting, and that generally works with most any other bird, except for grouse. You have to be much more instinctive. You have to shoot out front. You have to shoot early. You can't wait for it. You have to really just go with your gut and get them quickly because they're so fast within moments they're gone. And so therefore it's a whole different process. Yeah, I, think, I think as well, it, they're, they're the, only, the only game bird in this country that man hasn't really been able to interfere with that much in the respect that they, you cannot rear them successfully in, in, any, in what you would call commercial numbers. So they're the only really wild game bird that's still shot in this country. Uh, partridge, pheasants, duck, it doesn't matter. Any, if you pick any of the rest of the other game birds that you can shoot in the British Isles, the vast majority of them are, are, are reared by man, whereas these, you, you're simply providing the habitat and the environment for them, and given a bit of luck with the weather, they, they do the job themselves. And mm. after that, it's, de it's dealing with them after that that the problem begins. Mm. We'll get to the dealing with them later on, but why, why do you think they have never been tamed? Well, people have tried, they can't be done. Well, they, they eat very exclusively. They only eat heather. They eat 99% of their diet is heather shoots. They nest in heather, they hide in heather, they eat heather. No heather, no grouse. And one of the problems, actually, about when people have tried to rear them, and they have very successfully reared them in small numbers, but they become so tame that they're practically impossible to turn out on the moor and to then drive or do any with. Right. They become aggressive, don't they? They yes. attack you when, yes. you when you go and look at them. Mm. Uh, but that reminds me very much of a grouse which we had on the moor last year. Um, for some reason or other, it became very tame. It was at an area where there were lots of cars used to park on the side of the road. And this, this grouse lives a cock grouse, a male grouse, and it used to object to these cars parking in what it regarded was its territory. And how did it object? So, it used to attack them. And I had... The cars or the owners? Both. 
both. It would, it would attack the cars as they drove past on the road, but if you were foolish enough to get out of the car, he would come up to you, going, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back, like that, with his hackles up, and he would, he would peck your ankle, and he would <laughs> fly up and flutter up your leg, and he'd have a go at your stomach, and, he would, and you had to push him away. It was quite amazing. Mm. And where's that, where's that grouse now? Is it still attacking yeah, the cow? Well, well uh, you know, Peregrine got him, actually. <laughs> peregrine got him about a week later. He was he was altogether too tame, and um, and the peregrine got him. Now you spoke earlier of of um, personifying of the dangers of personifying the grouse, but that's just what you you did then, Sir Anthony. You you could identify that grouse of having a very different characteristic to the to the other grouse. There's something special of it because it lives, as I said, in this very wild place. People have written poems and books and articles and painted more pictures of grouse than any other game bird. There must be a reason for that. It has a very romantic and evocative aura about it. Back in the days of no motorways, blessed days, when people travelled by train, there was a great tradition of travelling from Euston Station for the glorious Twelfth. Many poems have been written about it. I have an example here which starts, I'll just read the opening couple of lines, um, Stranger with a pile of luggage proudly labelled for poor tree. How I wish this night in August I were you and you were me. And the poem goes on to relate the long journey, the ferry trip, and finally getting to the moors. And the last couplet is, Go, and good luck travel with you. Wish I'd half your luck, my man. Mm. You can imagine the scene on Euston Station, that very <clears throat> quiet station, with the piles of hide-bound cases, the gun magazines, the r respectful keepers and gillies carrying the stuff and people in tweeds with this air of quiet expectation and excitement, going far from the grime of London smoke, thundering through the night on a sleeper, and waking up in the magic of the moors, the misty moorlands. Nobody ever wrote like that about pheasants. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, Somewhere, it, very, it very much was a mass exodus in those days oh, from yes. London, oh, yeah. because, I mean, the, 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 the railway really made it possible. Before that, grouse shooting really had been very much for, for the few who actually lived in, in yeah. the countryside itself. But That's it why really Parliament mm. broke up at that time, wasn't yes. it? So that the MPs could go and yeah, very much so. Mm. But there was a very good picture, and I can't remember who painted it, but it was on the, on the platform at the station. Mm. And exactly what you're saying, the people there with masses of dogs all going mm. with, in charge of the guard and fishing rods and guns and everything and all the family and all the luggage mm. and it's quite it's quite a well-known picture mm. and then you went on from there and then the moment came when the 12th of august arrived and people started shooting and bags were were got and um and the the times newspaper correspondent would be hanging on somewhere desperately trying to get some information about what people had shot and what the bags were and what the moor was and everything and it would be in the newspapers the next day just like football results are now <laughs> oh yeah the moors were doing you remember mm. the lovely story of lord walsing what a way to die this was i think it was lord walsing but one of those giants of the golden age who stood in his butt for the last drive before lunch he killed 72 grouse he handed his gun to his loader. He stepped out of his butt and lit a cigar and dropped dead on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought you were going to say a grouse got him. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a story about that too. Well, you see, about the man being hit by the falling grouse. A falling J. grouse down the Glorious Twelve. The glorious Twelve. Mm, yeah. And he one became a grouse. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the one world. you're talking about was. Um, was it what, well, he was. was uh, no, no, he was. Um, he was one of the giants. Yes, he was. And he had Dalligill. And the, right. the, they've still got on the game card today. Roger McPhail did a game card with the exact place where he stood by his butt, they've got a big lump of concrete, and he shot exactly, I think it was 66 grouse and one right. snipe, and on the card, Roger McPhail has painted, if you look very carefully all around, the 66 grouse around about, and one snipe going over. And Parker, I take it, I mean, I don't think, are grouse shot in, in, in America or, or not? Um, we have grouse, but we don't, they're more <clears throat> walked up. We don't have any driven <coughs> shooting. In America, and we have we don't have moors, obviously. So that's why it's extra special to be able to come over and do it here. Mm. So you don't live here; you you, you live in the states, or uh, and then I come, come back and forth for shooting. Mm. Does that make Britain a better place than America? You think? Well, I wouldn't say better place, but certainly different. Mm. Uh, that the shooting is probably the best in the world. They've got better powder skiing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you yeah. have to be able to do both. 
Yeah, I, I think I think I so, something that that must be remembered about the red grouse is that it is, it is the only bird in the British Isles that is indigenous to this country. You will find it nowhere else in the world, uh, except for odd ones that have been taken in, in experiments to try and introduce them to other places. And in most cases, it failed to the point that the little populations that have been exported from Britain have more or less died out completely. Mm -hmm. But it, it is unique to Britain, and that's why people come from all over the world. They come from Switzerland, America, you know, everywhere to shoot this bird that is absolutely superb. It's, it's a king amongst game birds in that respect. And you must all still get a wonderful feeling when you see the grouse coming over the, the hills first thing in the morning. But the first driven grouse I ever shot, just this is the speed of the thing, used to partridges a lot, that you raise the gun and blot, it, blot and twitch is the old trick, blot and twitch. And a single grouse rose at the end of the drive and came <laughs> screaming down the wind towards me. And I blotted and I twitched, I twitched a bit more the bird was 45 yards out in front, I suppose, and as I pulled the trigger, it was here. I could see it here. And you know where the second shot went, probably somewhere near Timbuktu. And that's how <laughs> fast it was just oh. gone like that. And what exactly is blotting and twitching? <laughs> well, a, a, a bird that's approaching you straight, straight, out, straight on, the theory is that you blot it out with the barrels and you swing, and as you just about to pull the trigger, you give a little extra twitch. This is for particularly hard and fast birds. So applying that to the grouse, you have to twitch a hell of a lot more than you would for partridge. This is why I keep missing them. That was great, yes. Not enough twitch. Not enough twitch. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's what I think is so difficult about them. When you get one, you're so pleased. Our moor is a small bag moor, but is it a hundred times more fun to shoot a hundred grouse than to shoot one? Well, that's the question. My little son with his... I have a photograph here. And Peter with his first grouse along with his friend Sam Dennis and two proud fathers standing behind them with beaming smiles. Who was the more proud? It's hard to say. Though that single grouse gave so much pleasure, it's a feat still talked about, although it was 15 years ago. Mm. Uh, in each of their cases, and little feathers were pulled out and stuck in game books, and the event was written mm. in sort of red letters of blood, because it was such an important and such a valuable and super thing. And the other point about the boys like this, ours is a family war where a lot of youngsters and chums come. It was such a civilising influence on youngsters to be mixing with adults in grown-up company, doing grown-up things and growing up there. Some children were born during our tenure on this moor, have grown up to become beaters and have since shot their first grouse. It has that sense of continuity. Rich friendships have been made as well as children growing up and the linchpin that holds them all together is this strange red bird that lives up in this inhospitable place. So is it true that the first grouse you kill is the best grouse of all? It's always very memorable. <coughs> you can always remember it. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. You well, never do about, it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you, Barbara? When was, what was the first grouse you... Well, I wasn't meant to be shooting at all. I was, <coughs> I was what they call a flanker, and stuck out on the side with a large flag to sort of, you know, make sure that the birds came through the line. This was in Wales. And um, eventually I got very exhausted and washing around. This gun said, well, come and stand in my butt for the next drive. It's only a small return drive, a very short drive. So I went and stood in his butt and oh, he was going bang, bang and nothing was falling. And after a while he said, I can't hit a bloody thing. He said, if I miss the next bird, you have a go. Well, he missed the next bird and he handed me this enormous, great, heavy gun. Anyway, I grabbed the gun. The next bird that came over, luckily, was fairly high, which gives them a bit more time. And I swung through, not knowing what I was doing, and down it came. So the gun wasn't at all pleased. <laughs> I very quickly <laughs> left the butt and went back to my <laughs> flagging. <laughs> but that was my first. Mm. You've never forgotten it all those years no, ago? No, no, oh, absolutely. Right. Yes. Mm. It took me three years to shoot my first. I used to go in, the mid in my <clears throat> mid-twenties with a friend who had a little moor in Wales. And there were hardly any grouse, and it was, we always went on August the 12th. It was always hot, and we hardly see anything. And by the halfway through the day, you have the gun broken over your shoulder and cartridges in pockets, just hoping to survive the day. And it was literally three years before I actually finally shot one of these, uh, these damn things. It must but, have been uh, a wonderful feeling. That was great. It was wonderful. I never me, really looked back. It took me a good full day to shoot, yeah. to shoot one. I remember the first time I came over, and I was with a some friends from New York and um, the first drive I was on the top of the hill and I didn't know what grouse shooting was about and I was up there waiting and waiting and waiting started fidgeting with my gear and messing around and all of a sudden a covey of at least 20 
came right over my butt, and not a shot was fired. And everyone was just looking up mortified, something must be wrong. And I thought, well, at least that's over. I'm sure no more grouse will be coming this way. I can just kind of watch and figure things out. So again, I was piddling around, waiting. Boom, here they came again. And I've got one shot off behind me. And the day just kept going like that. I had no idea how fast it was. And I think I might have hit two during the whole day. Very frustrating, but... Yeah. The thing about them is they're so soft feathered, but if you do hit one, they're so easy to kill. And this is a strange anomaly. It always was for me, because on our little moor, they put in some new fence posts about 10 years ago, with um, which were raw um, posts with bark on. And the winter weather was so hostile, it was like a sandblaster. I didn't tell you people who lived there, but it had just ripped off this bark with pellets of snow, like bullets. And these soft feathered grouse lived up there throughout all that weather in which you couldn't have survived. And yet one pellet is enough to knock one down, which wouldn't mm. kill a pheasant. Wouldn't, no, kill, wouldn't kill a partridge, they're soft feathered birds and easy I, to kill. If you I notice you say soft feathered, but there is a tremendous difference and I know Lindsay will agree with me here, there's an immense difference between early in the season when the warm weather and the birds mm. are there for with their feathers right. reasonably out. The moment you get a bit of frost and you get into the later end of the season, they tighten up. And I mean, that's why most um, grass people change from seven shot to six shot at the, at the end of the season. Those mm. birds stand an awful lot of shot right. and still fly on. <laughs> if grouse shooting represents a way of life or whether it is a way of life? Certainly for me, it, it, it is a way of life, very much a way of life, because I think the difference between the gamekeeper, which I am, and the people who come in and, and, and enjoy the sport, I mean, I'm the provider in that respect. It's, it's, it's like anyone in any other sport who actually provides the sports for others to enjoy, and in that respect, it, I have a totally different perspective to it in some respects. I enjoy it nonetheless, but from a totally different point of view. Mm. Yes, and as a, I'm a moor owner, and I have the same as Lindsay, I'm a provider as well as an, as an enjoyer of it. And um, being lucky enough to actually own a moor and get involved throughout the whole year in the production of grouse, and then you see all the other birds that come up onto the moor to take advantage of the, of the condition that you're offering for the grouse. Mm. And the overall management of the moor, the balancing of, the, of how much you should shoot and when you should stop, and how you actually manage the heather and, and all the millions of other things that you have to do in order to ensure that there's a good stock of grouse for the 12th of August is an absolutely fascinating subject and very much a way of life. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you two um, younger ones if there's a... Is there, and no offence <laughs> to, to the others, but... Um, <laughs> is there a grouse shooting... Are there grouse shooting heroes, living heroes, a grouse shooting hierarchy, people you'd, you've always wanted to shoot with or people you respect because they've shot a lot of grouse? There, there are certainly some, some very good grouse shots about the... the, the current Duke of Northumberland comes to mind as a, as a wonderful shot, a lovely graceful shot and it, it's it's a great treat to be out on a moor with someone like that watching them shoot and watching someone shoot far better than I can. Um, I actually had a, a, a funny experience a, a few years ago, I was, uh, the shooting times, we're trying to find the top ten grouse shots um, and a big wind up, a lot of mates uh, put me forward as one of the top ten grouse shots which is anyone who shot with me, you have Parker, you know is definitely not true. Um, and um, I turned up to Royal Berkshire Shooting Ground to, uh, to be tested and ten people were invited and one didn't turn up and <laughs> I came last. So it makes me the ninth best grouse shot in the country. <laughs> and is that, true? is that true, Parker? Or? There are many, many great shots. Um, and certainly the more you do it, the better you get. But I don't think that's true. I've been really? lucky this season, I've done a lot of grouse shooting, I didn't seem to get any better. Well, I think, you know, people who are on the moor a lot and watch them and watch other people shoot. I've, I've learned most of what I know just from watching others and getting their timing down, which I think is so important with grouse. And if I stand with, behind a good shot, I, I often just go back and try to emulate what he's just done and how he's stood down or come up or 
bolted or twitched. Bolted or twitched. <laughs> Blotted or twitched. Blotted or twitched. <laughs> Blotted or twitched. <laughs> Blotted or twitched. <laughs> I must try that. that <laughs> Blotted Blotted that's where I've been going yeah. wrong. There's a lovely story about Lord Porchester who, uh, uh, over dinner one night over the port, was explaining how it was possible to kill five grouse from the same covey with a pair of guns. And his theory was that you, you fired quite out of range with the first gun with a choke barrel only. You changed guns, you took two in front and two behind in the traditional way, so you had five. The next day, I'll show you tomorrow. And sure enough, a large pack of grouse came from in front, and he did just as he said. He took, he fired his choke barrel, changed guns once. I'm left-handed, that's why I'm doing it like this. Two shots here, two shots there. All five shots got off. Missed every single one. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if anybody's ever shot two grouse with one bullet. Oh, yeah, that happened yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. We don't say bullets. Well, and no. the good shots, the bullet, good yeah. shots um, try to do it. Try to do it. I mean, if you're very quick, you can judge when two birds are crossing just as you farm, and, then, and you'll look for that. But it's, it's not bullets, John, you understand that. It's not bullets. Mm. A bullet is a single missile fired from a rifle uh, or a pistol, OK? Mm. For shooting big animals or people with. This is all with a shotgun, which is quite a lot of small pellets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perhaps four or five times the size of pinheads. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Shoot at, but no, that's right, just a small point. The listeners but, might yeah. not appreciate that. It's important the difference mm -hmm. should be made. Mm -hmm. But you, you touched on two things, actually, Neither before, which are, which are interlinked to a certain extent. You, you mentioned, you know, does practice make perfect? Mm -hmm. and, and you also mentioned the toughness of the bird. And actually, I don't think there's much doubt that if you're fortunate enough to start shooting on the 12th of August, and wind yourself up as the grouse wind themselves up during the course of the season. Mm -hmm. It makes it an awful lot different when, by the time the middle of November or even December comes because they are a totally different bird by totally now. Totally different yeah. bird. They're two, know. three times the speed and their reactions are, are they unbelievable. they more canny? Do you think, do you think uh, well, have they, do, do they have, have um, metaphorically speaking, word got back to them? They're much more wary. You oh, often yes. see, oh, yes. particularly with a bit of wind, you see the grouse coming, the shot will be fired and the pack will turn. Mm. Um, yeah. But I, there's a nice evolutionary story about that, mm -hmm. in that in Yorkshire, you have two big blocks of moorland. On the right of the A1, you have the North Yorkshire moors, and on the left of the A1, you have the Pennines, the North Pennines, the York, what we call the Yorkshire Dales. And the grouse on the Yorkshire Dales, um, when they have been shot three or four times, all get into a big pack and come over. They know, they've said, they, they've learned over the centuries that um, if somebody, somebody's got, he's got two shots to fire at them, if they come over in a group of 50 or 60, he's only got two chances of getting them. So the vast majority of them are bound to get away. On the North Yorkshire Moor, they've never learnt that trick, and they still come over in their family coveys. And, um, and the penny hasn't dropped yet, and, and they're, about four, they're only 40 miles apart, but it's quite obvious that the, that the grouse from the North Yorkshire Moors have never come across the A1 to the Yorkshire Dales to tell their cousins <laughs> how to get away with it. Well, how do you think they tell each other? <sighs> That's... Well, I, I mean, how, I... How, do, how does a migratory mm. bird tell... tell a, how does a leader of a flock of geese coming, a skein of geese coming over, uh, tell where to go? Who's the leader? How do they communicate? We don't oh, know. I once that, had a pen of... Um, this is nothing to do with grouse at all. It's about to get rather on the same point. I had a pen of European quail. The quail are very prolific. They're sexually mature in a matter of weeks, and they will have three or four clutches during a year. These quail were perhaps 150 generations from wild stock. They'd been captive all their lives way back. And yet in the little hutch, when a big bird flew over, a crow or a gull, they would put their chins on their ground and their bottoms in the air, mm. which is their escape lying like stone so they wouldn't be spotted by what they thought was an eagle or a hawk. Now, why do you think they did that? Mm. How did they learn that? Did they inherited that? Mm. It's a genetic it's thing, a, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you get it with budgerigars in Australia. You get any, right. Anywhere where birds flock, they go into numbers for safety's sake. It's almost yeah. like fish in the sea. Mm. The larger the shoal, the lesser chance there is of you being predated if something comes along to eat you. And grouse are exactly the same. Even when you're not driving a grouse moor, if you get one of the large birds of prey on the moor, you'll get grouse in large numbers, and they quite simply mm. go into bigger and bigger lots because they know that their chances of survival are so much greater. That's quite true, yes. Mm. And mm. Mm. It sounds to me, Sir Anthony, from what you've been saying, that they're, 
a certain, a certain mutual respect or bond has formed between you and the grass. Yes, it's something, it's very true that. It's something very, very difficult to explain to people how you can possibly love a bird as much as I do and yet kill it. Um, but, um, I mean, I wouldn't dream of killing a grass if I felt that I was ending the species. Uh, um, and the indivi an individual grouse, to me, all I'm doing is, is, is shooting the surplus that there is on that particular moor at that particular time. And I'm not endangering the overall long-term sustainability of, of the grouse population. Mm -hmm. So I can just settle back down and enjoy my sport and, 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 and get the thrill out of trying to, trying to shoot a very, very fast-moving, very difficult target. Mm -hmm. um, so, but at the very moment, that I'm shooting, that I feel that there is the long term, a long term danger that I am, well, the, uh, that I'm ending the future of that uh, bird in any way. Well, I'm not interested. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even shoot that bird. Mm. Um, and I think an awful lot of shooting people are. Uh, in it, I hope I mm. feel the same way. But that principle applies to all grouse moor management. When you, you might sort of organise a day's grouse shoot, it'll be cancelled because the moor owner thinks that the stock of grouse is not sufficient mm. to to be shot. It must be um, a disappointment, but you... It's, a, it's a huge disappointment, but um, the privilege of shooting grass is that they're wild birds and um, that, uh, as Lindsay said, you can't rear them. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, have to, you have to accept that and, and better the, the moor owner who will say, no, we're not going to shoot, I'll forego the income to make sure there's grass next year and the year after, which is what conservation for shooting is all about, whether it's grouse or any other bird. And although, as you've heard, the grouse is the wild bird, it is only because people like this manage and maintain moorland for grouse shooting that the grouse survives at all, because everything needs a hand these days. I mean, mankind has interfered with the environment so much. And that, as Sir Anthony suggested, the pipits, the merlins, the frogs, the snakes, all live in this environment which is managed for grouse. Grouse moors that have died out have just become very often, miles and miles of softwood conifers with not a grouse, not a bird, not a bird song. Nothing lives in that black, mm. dank canopy. You will never see another grouse there, mm. ever. Yeah, I mean, Gone I, for good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a double-edged thing in that respect. I mean, we, we owe the grouse rather a lot because to it we owe our living. And in that respect, we, we, we have a regard to take care of it for future generations. And there's, there's not the slightest doubt that, that any moor owner or any gamekeeper worth his salt, one of the most important things that you have to decide every year is when you're going to stop shooting. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and from one day to the next, one day you're doing your best to kill these things, and the next day, as soon as you've decided enough is enough, you're doing your very best to keep the remainder alive, because mm -hmm. that's your next year. Do you yeah. think the grouse instinctively know and, and are... Oh, and are pleased about all the good that you're doing for them. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they, so they have fine. smiles. Yeah, they, they very quickly learn when the shooting season has it finished. Did, that's true. Very quickly yeah. learn. Yeah. That's quite um, true. How so? Come the 10th of December, it's quite extraordinary how much tamer they suddenly Well, get. even before the 10th of December, you can, you can drive grouse regularly, week after week after week, and they do get extremely touchy because they get enough of these people coming and trying to catch up with them. Uh, within two to three weeks, they very often, if the weather is kind to them, they've paired up, they've got their territories, and the whole moor is a totally different place to what it was. It's settled down, it's much, much quieter. Mm. Um, you get the cock grouse just crowing down on their territories all the time, and it, 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 it really is quite a contrast. Mm. And as I say, they, they learn quite quickly when, mm. enough, when, when you've finished. Mm. Are they huge shots, that grouse? It's only a long time ago. It's <laughs> not very well stuffed, ago. but it's... Some of your props it, department. The plumage does vary considerably from yes. individuals, but um, that sort of gives you the rough idea. It's a bit of a caricature. Mm. But going back, to, sorry, going back to the keepering on the moors, during the war, when an awful lot of the keepers were taken up and went into the army and left, a lot of moors were left unkeepered. And it was very, very noticeable. There were some that belonged to an uncle of mine over in Lancashire, and it was very noticeable that during that period, what had been very good moors indeed, suddenly, absolutely, um, the, the grouse dwindled and dwindled. By the time the end of the moor, and they came to try and get them going again, they were very, very pushed to have any stock to start with. And this was because there, were, there was nothing, there was no vermin, there was no um, control of the moor, no burning, the heather wasn't managed, the whole environment wasn't controlled. Mm. 
but the, they had been very good moors. Mm. There were some grouse moors in mid Wales that were once some of the best in the yes. whole of Britain. Yes. What are they now? Eighty years ago. Yes. Now they're barren. There's, there's mm. pretty sheep, well every off. single moor owner in the North Pennines or in the North Yorkshire moors, on their individual moors, shoot more grouse than are shot in the whole of Wales in a year. Mm. Mm. Is there a ritual that goes with your first grouse? You, you spoke about um, about um, letters in blood and sticking feathers in... in it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't totally too literally, John. It wasn't mm. letters in blood. It was letters of red. Oh. A red biro, probably. Not grouse <laughs> biro. <laughs> there's no sort of blooding ceremony. There's, then, there's no blooding ceremony. But can you imagine at the moment, travelling, hopefully, mm. is better than arriving, it is said, but not in the case of shooting your first grouse. Mm. Because these youngsters on our moor came as babies carried on their mother's backs in those papooses their mothers being beaters and plodders mm. and they aspired to carrying a stick and walking for half a day and then going home and then for walking all of a day and then for being beaters and driving around and carrying a flag mm. a long long apprenticeship mm. and you mustn't I think with youngsters spoil them by saying here it is it's easy do it mm. when they're too young otherwise they don't appreciate it they have to earn it mm. I've always mm. been Grouse have to be earned. As an American, yeah. watching how the English do bring up their uh, children who are interested in shooting, because I've never seen such um, gun management, gun control, respect of the quarry mm -hmm. like I've seen over here. We, it just simply is not done in any place mm -hmm. else in the world um, mm -hmm. other than England. There's such a high respect mm -hmm. for the grouse or whatever it is. Um, I went which to, is I wonderful went about years, English values. For, for just two years just carrying my gun. I wasn't allowed when I was 12 <laughs> or 11. I can't remember now. I was given a 28 ball and, um, and I was just dying to, to go out and shoot my first you. rabbit. I was told I could take the gun out and I can go and wander about as long as I like, but I wasn't allowed any cartridges. Then the, then the moment would, would arrive when I was allowed to, to the, the cartridges and then I'd go out with my father and my father would take me. I certainly couldn't go out on my own. Um, and then I would, the great moment would arrive when I'd actually shoot a rabbit or something like that. And then even after that, the, the even greater, more exciting moment when I was allowed to go out on my own with my dog. And then I had a little <laughs> spaniel, and we used to hunt away with a spaniel, and oh, that really was fun. Let's talk about butts and life in the butt. Um, and what goes on in the butt? <laughs> James, have, have you... You've, got up to some things in the butt, haven't you? I've heard he has. <laughs> Do you not wish to talk about your butt well, experiences? I, I, it, it has been rumoured that I've been involved in hot passion in a grass butt. <laughs> well, is, is it true? Is it true? You he might think that I could possibly comment. I didn't start the rumour, no. <laughs> so would you care to elaborate on the hot passion in the butt? Well, it, it, it would Because not many people but, can... It wouldn't be proper to, uh, hmm. to do that, but... Uh, um, it's, I, I've always said that, that, that grouse shooting is, is better than anything, and <laughs> it's certainly better than sex, but actually, <laughs> but sex, sex in, in a grouse butt is actually quite fun. <laughs> so is it One assumes. The grouse and fun. sex at the same time is really stretch pushing things a bit too far, is it? Or, well, uh, he, he is uh, number nine. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have the gun in your hand at the time? Did you, you probably have, have half it. an eye on the grouse and... <laughs> You'd, you'd, have, you'd have to have the gun lying sort of at the front of the butt, ready to be picked up, so you just... So it would be loaded? Of course it would be loaded, yeah. <laughs> you just change weapons and then <laughs> shoot the grouse. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Are there any occasions um, when you'd, uh, aside from the um, extinction, the potential extinction issue that you spoke of earlier, are there any occasions in which one would uh, let the grouse off, as it were? Uh, yeah, oh, yes. Um, well, there was a quite a good one. Um, we had a, a uh, my grandfather um, was shooting, and there was um, a French team, and and the French in my grandfather's day were not regarded as being sporting shots at all. You know, they were the sort of those people across the channel who did nothing but shoot blackbirds and thrushes, and and, um, oh, no, no, and no. really didn't understand the sort of the finer <laughs> points of etiquette of shooting grouse. And um, this grouse, for some strange reason decided to walk across the road just in front of this Frenchman and to my grandfather's astonishment he didn't actually shoot at it um, and so he went up to him afterwards and congratulated him and said I, I noticed that that, that grouse that was crossing the road on foot there um, 
you didn't shoot at it. Well done, well done. And the Frenchman said, oh, I know. I was waiting for it to stand still. <laughs> <laughs> now, have any of you let, let, found yourself in a position where you felt that the grass must live? I, mean, I, I, th I think, to go back to my perspective of things, I mean, we do call a halt at times when the weather conditions are just too bad. And that may be, you may say, that's as much for the people's sake as it is for the grouse's sake. But uh, on the other hand, when things do get pretty grim, we, we sometimes just say enough is enough and, uh, you know, we, we can do no more. It either may be torrential rain, it may be gales, it may be a combination of both. And uh, particularly if it snows, um, grouse, if you put any bird actually on the wing, they tend to get somewhat disorientated. Mm. And you, you cannot drive them at all if it's snowing. So. Weather conditions invariably bring things to a halt. Mm. But I think you are you are there to shoot grouse, of course. And, uh, by a strange enigma, the more you shoot them, the better it is for them. Mm. And that's perhaps a hard one to swallow, but it's perfectly true. Their populations tend to be cyclical. I'm in the presence of people who know more, far more about it than I, but I know that much. They tend to have great gluts, and there are uncountable grouse. And then because of their sheer numbers, they decline as spectacularly and so that for the next couple of years there is a terrible shortage. And in those circumstances you might say, well, these are recovery years, we will shoot lightly. But I think the implication of your question was on a shooting day for grouse cane, there would be no circumstances upon which you would spare it. Mm. You might say we won't shoot tomorrow, or we mm. might pack up because it's snowing, mm. or whatever. Mm. I think you might not put a gun up to a bird that's sort of struggling Squeaker. against the wind, or a a, uh, certainly a young one, a squeaker. Yeah. A lame yes. grouse. Sorry? A lame grouse. Well, lame grouse you definitely shoot because yeah. um, well, it's, it's going to die. It's doomed yeah. anyway, yes. Mm -hmm. a, a, yes. Wounded, a, yeah. a grouse that had been wounded the previous yeah. week and was sort of struggling and hang, hanging on, you'd want to humanely uh, kill it as quickly yeah. as possible. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't but very anything, young you and immature birds, yeah. no, nobody shoots those spectrum. intentionally, but sometimes travelling very swiftly, um, it's, it's think, difficult when they're coming head on to tell, and you sometimes find that you have shot younger bird than you would have normally, but not normally. And is it an awful feeling when the bird lands on the ground and you realise it's just a well, little baby? You, you, you just feel that you wouldn't have normally done it. Mm. You Tough. wouldn't have done it, but yeah. depend, it also depends at the, at the time of the season. If a grouse is inordinately late, I mean, you, you sometimes get these very small birds even in mid-September. And that being the case, if the weather was to turn quite severe quite quickly, which it can do in our part of the world, I mean, you can get snow by the end of September or certainly into October, there's a very good chance that those young grouse will not live anyway. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, it's, it's not necessarily a great crime to do it in that respect. I mean, these poor things have just been born almost out of season mm. for one reason or another. They're very tender, mm. good to eat. Yeah, they're very good to eat, aren't they? <laughs> now, is, is, um, well, it's a two-part question. Um, is grouse shooting a class thing? And if it is, three-part question, if it is, would you like it to be more classless? And if you would, um, how does one go about doing that? <laughs> well, the first thing is, what are you describing as class? Because are you talking about hereditary breeding or are you talking about money? Because let's be quite clear, most grouse shooting is expensive. And therefore, it puts itself into a class of those who can afford and those who are lucky enough to be invited. So do you get so... Do the nouveaux want to come and... and oh, uh, very much so. Yeah. Mm. Very oh, much very so. Much so yeah. mm. It it's yeah. actually covers every, every <coughs> aspect of class, quite honestly. Mm. And, I mean, when you have a keeper's day at the end of the season, which I hope you do, Lindsay, that I thoroughly approve of, that the keepers will go out and a lot of the beaters and flankers will come and bring their guns and they'll take it in turns to drive to each other. Mm. And they have marvellous days at the end of December, don't they? Yes, I mean, I, uh, I, I hope it doesn't put any of them in jeopardy, but I think we have the very best of it because we're shooting these things when they really are, are at their utmost. Uh, unfortunately, for, for a good few of the chaps who come and, and help on those days, because it is a keepers and helpers day, uh, it is the only opportunity very often in a whole season that they get the chance to shoot these things, and they're shooting them when they're at their most difficult. And uh, Consequently, their strike rates are not that great, but they enjoy the day nevertheless. I mean, it really is very much appreciated. Now, you spoke earlier, John, about, um, well, the poem, that, that, that great poem, and... and you know, the, the, the tradition of it all. And um, does, the, does the, the new money types um, dissipate from that tradition, do you think? Not at all. I think they are perpetuating it. There's a very healthy mixture now of people who... It is not 
a sport perhaps like pheasant shooting where you would go and do a great deal of grouse shooting you're very rich you have to be a good shot you have to be dogged and determined enough to make the physical effort that is demanded by it the old aristos have no longer got the money it's very sadly now their faded gentility have not got the funds that they had once to be able to go and stand on Euston Station every 12th of August mm. and go and pr prop it up. It is now people who have made their money in other ways. It is new money. But to come back to your earlier question, it is quite possible now for people who are would not consider themselves normally to be grouse shooters to buy by the day or by the week the walking on quite a moderate moor that's not good enough to sustain driving. And this gives people who would not normally have the chance to shoot grouse the opportunity to walk and shoot this most exciting bird to breathe in air that's like champagne and listen to the tumbling streams and feel their legs aching at the end of the day and watch rather tremulously as a huge rain cloud <laughs> comes up on the wind mm. and do all those things mm. and I think that's probably very very good for the sport and that wouldn't have happened at the time that Euston Station poem was written. Mm. But does one find that it there was are, the toffs. Mm, does one find that there's um, some members of, of the old money classes who uh, who feel quite um, I don't use loaded words but feel quite separatist about the about the new money people? Or am I am I treading on uh, on sensitive? Just said I wouldn't have thought no, so. I, yeah. I can think of one new person to come in grow shooting not a million miles away from us. Um, and we all spend from sort of round about October time, we're all, every time the telephone rings, we're hurtling to pick it up to see whether it's an invitation to go shooting with him. Uh, and he's uh, American. <laughs> <laughs> and he's invested an enormous amount of money into his moor. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and, and full marks. Yeah, yeah. That, that feels possible too. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's mm. not alone in that respect. I mean, th there has been a considerable upsurge in the last few years in grouse moors. I mean, their values have gone up considerably, and there is c considerable interest. If a grouse moor comes on the market, there are no shortage of people looking for it. And, no, and having got it, they're also very, very willing to invest in it. I mean, the number of gamekeepers in the north of England, and in Scotland as well, for that matter, of it, on grouse moors is actually on the up, mm. and has been for a few years now. And that's reversing a trend that had gone on for a very long time. Mm. People are buying a moor that has, say, two keepers on it, and they're putting an extra one or two on it. Mm. So, I mean, it's the new money, as you say, is, is actually seen from my side of things as a very good thing in that respect. Mm. And it will help perpetuate these places for the future. And whole rural economies, things like the local hotels and the pubs. Mm. And the game dealers. The game dealers, the restaurateurs, the people who go beating have been mentioned to you already. All rural economies. Gunsmiths, indeed. Cartridge manufacturers, clothing makers. I'm interested to know, roughly speaking, what, what sort of money are we talking about? At £80 a brace. Mm. So, and how many brace? Uh, and, and, an, and an average, uh, you'd, you'd be looking at sort of 80 to 100 brace. 75 to 100 brace would be the sort of day that you'd be looking for. So you're talking that, you're talking... Six thousand, seven thousand, six thousand, seven thousand pounds for the day, divided between the number of guns that there are, and they're normally about eight. Mm. So you're talking about the neck. And by the time they've they've stayed in a hotel and had lunch and travelled up, you're talking about the neck end of a thousand pounds each for a for a day. Mm. Let's move on to the um, saboteurs. Have, have they <laughs> have they sabotaged you yet, or are they still? Uh, just sticking to the foxes and so there, on. There's normally a, a token effort on the glorious 12th uh, for public maximum publicity. Has uh, it been to your moor? So no, they never have. No, they have. They, I've been on a moor when they when they have arrived, but they've never been on mine. What do they do? They'd take their clothes off and run up and down shrieking. For the, was was this particular on this particular case? Really uh, naked. Well, it took from there upwards. Mm. But I think he was mad. I, he was not typical. Um, on the, there's been other examples of a more on the 12th of August this last year, uh, when a, a big group of them came and beat up a, a bunch of elderly Americans in a very unpleasant manner, um, and that was very unfortunate. I, I don't. I mean, I hope that. I mean, I respect their views. You know, they, they're, they're in fully entitled to their own opinion about a very difficult thing for people to understand. Um, but they certainly shouldn't be, shouldn't do that. Mm. Mm. And have all of you been, um, been um, sabbed? 
subbed. Is that the word? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've been subbed. Oh, yes. What happened? From the very beginning, because um, I shoot on quite a big moor, and because it's um, rather a prestige moor, they love it, and they always turn up on the 12th. But we then gradually got um, protection team who come and look after it. And now they don't come near. They take one look and they see that the chaps are there and they leave us. Mm. But I remember one year they came and they were rushed and very, very excited. They saw there was a woman in the butt. They rushed into my butt and the whole lot collected there. And they really were very unattractive, horrible looking people. And eventually um, I was determined I wasn't going to be turned out of my butt by them. Everybody else left and I said, no, I'm going when I'm ready. So eventually I turned to my keeper and said, I think we can find better company than this and walked out of the butt. And as we went out of the butt, my young dog cocked his leg all down the shelf. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, now that shows you exactly what we think of you. <laughs> what did they do when they rushed into the butt? They just stand Oh, there? they start sort of saying, uh, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You know, you feed birds in onto these hides and then you stand here and shoot them. So I said, well, there wouldn't be much left if we shot them at that range. Mm. And because they see foil all over the top of the butts, they're quite certain that we feed them onto the top of the butts. Like a bird table. Exactly. And, and then he said, so you, rear little about them. It. Yes. you rear all these birds. And I said, well, I can tell you, you don't know anything about it. <laughs> I said, nobody rears grouse for, for sporting purposes. I think there are certain grounds upon which you might attack country sports if you wish to. But you certainly wouldn't do it in their way because they're so uninformed mm. and so ignorant and so bigoted. And, I mean, unpleasant. Perhaps they think we're unpleasant. Probably do. And I think the point's been made by Sir Anthony, that everybody's entitled to a point of view. If you and I disagree, that's fine. But the old tradition of this country was that you could go to the devil in your own way, as long as you didn't frighten the horses. If you and I have come to different conclusions about the morals of grouse shooting, so be it. We go our separate ways. But a lot of things happen about which I disapprove. But you, you say, don't well, this is other people's things. American. I don't put a, a <coughs> balaclava helmet on and get a pickaxe handle and a gang of my mates who are paid, let it be said, 15 to 20 pounds a day and a lunch and transport to go out and attack mm. people who could be your grandfather and smash their vehicles. Who pays and them? them? There are various organisations which are dedicated to the abolition of anything which involves the exploitation of animals. If I told you, for example, that on their hit list is racing pigeons, that might surprise you. On their list certainly is angling. I thought the racing pigeons enjoyed the racing. Not at all. It is your exploiting animals. Mm. They wouldn't so come back, would they? Those are keeping them enjoying it. Oh, you train them to do it, you see, with cruelty, probably, and electrodes, or they make up, they trump up something. Anything which man, it, which man can be seen to exploit animals or birds, is to be banned. That's mm. the word. Ban it. Mm. Stop it. it. But do you okay. find yourselves over over port after the shoot, sort of, you know, anecdoting about the sabs, or Certainly do you just? Not. It's a very bad and unpleasant subject. We talk about much tonight. We're not there to talk about that. And let's move on to eating grouse, which I suppose is the oh. uh, the final part oh, of the of the, yeah. of the night out. I mean, one of the things that hits me is that it, it, it'll be full of pellets, won't it? So, so that's a that's a problem. Not if they're shot in the head, <laughs> like all yours are. <laughs> <laughs> they operated on a gamekeeper once. They found three hundred and eighty-six pellets of lead in his appendix. He made a full recovery. <laughs> oh yes, is that true? It's perfectly true. Yes. Mm. I mean, everybody eats a lot of shot. You have to eat a peck of dirt before you die, and if some of it's lead pellets. But it's so funny, what? though, you don't... I, I mean, I eat an awful lot. I've eaten an awful lot of grouse in my life. I've probably got 386 pellets in my life. <laughs> I haven't noticed, but... Are and you, you don't... I mean, every now and then you come across one on a leg or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't feel that... I mean, I very, very rarely eat a grouse which has got a lead pellet in it. Mm. Very well, yeah, do you I agree? quite agree. That shows how well the keeper's chosen them for you, Sir Anthony. Yeah, <laughs> well done, Lindsay. That's a good, well done. That's good, well said. So is a yeah. grouse a particularly tasty bird? Mm. I'm not sure that I can put my hand on my heart and say, I've ever eaten a grouse. It's not to well, everybody's taste. Well, must do so immediately. Mm. It, it, it's well, not immediately. Taste. It's strong. <laughs> it's quite strong What does it taste like? like? It's not like any other uh, meat, really. Um, and it's much stronger than any other game. Um, it's and it's very important that you cook it in the correct way as well. Mm. For it, I mean, it can be awful. You, first of all, you must first of all you must try. You must eat a young grouse rather than an old grouse. They're much more tasty, and then you must cook it in the right way. Which uh, is how? Well, 
you mustn't cook it. You must. You mustn't cook it. A young grouse for more than twenty minutes. Are they listening? Oh, it's very, very <laughs> important. <laughs> Um, and you must you must uh, cook it in a very hot oven with uh, with uh, plenty of fat or or bacon over the top of it for fifteen minutes. Um, you then take the bacon and the fat and give it a good basting, and then you give it a, a final burn for the last five minutes, and you take it out. But you must never cook a, a young grouse for more than twenty minutes in a hot oven, and then it's slightly pink and it's absolutely delicious. delicious. If when you're grouse shooting you pick a few clusters of the rowan berries and you stuff them inside it while you're cooking it. They have come from the same place, they're the natural flavour. And you can make some others into a jelly. I've never actually done that, and you obviously have done it lots of times. Rowan and jelly with it, and a strong bottle of claret, and eat it on the 12th. I think how few people there are in Britain that are eating young grouse with a bottle of claret on the 12th of August. We keep some in the freezer for that very purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so you get that little buzz of superiority. <laughs>